Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present on hyperbaric oxygen therapy in a resource restricted environment. My name is Gregory Weir and I am based in Pretoria, South Africa. According to the Department of Statistics of the Republic of South Africa, our country is known as one of the most unequal countries in the world, reporting a per capita expenditure Gini coefficient of 0 0.67 in 2006, dropping to 0 0.65 in 2015. This is according to the Inequality Trends in South Africa report. Please allow me the opportunity to give you an overview of my professional background to explain how I became involved in hyperbaric medicine. I always knew that I wanted to be a doctor and was fortunate to be accepted into the MBCHB course at the University of Pretoria in 1988. I completed my degree in 1993. I did my internship at Clarksthorpe and Chapong Hospitals in 1994. I was enthralled by the adrenaline rush associated with trauma surgery, of which I had a lot of exposure, and applied for the general surgery training program at the University of Pretoria, where I was accepted as a medical officer in 1995. My initial trial by fire included a year-long rotation at the Califong Hospital Burns Unit. I was thrown in on the deep end. Critical ill patients with extensive wounds and minimum support from senior personnel. I realized very quickly that I had to rely on the nursing personnel who tried to keep me sane while teaching me the importance of a multidisciplinary team approach. After completing my primary exams, I was accepted as Registrar in General Surgery and completed my Master's in Medicine in Surgery towards the end of 2000. In the last year of my training, a three-month rotation at Vascular Surgery became a 12-month rotation. By the end of 2000, I was absolutely addicted to Vascular Surgery and clawed my way into a Vascular Surgery Fellowship Program. I found my passion, something that I was excited about and that I could imagine doing for the next 40 years, God willing. I was trained by a master in the field of vascular surgery, Professor Kubus van Marle. Sadly, he passed away from COVID in 2021. After completing my vascular fellowship, I was ac accepted into a trauma and vascular fellowship at Westmead Hospital in Sydney, Australia. I was fortunate to work with Valerie Malka and Professor John Fletcher, to name a few. This was very useful in teaching me about health systems and further emphasized the importance of a multidisciplinary team approach in a first world environment. In spite of a very tempting offer to stay in Australia, I decided to return to South Africa. I was convinced that I had an obligation to return to my country of birth to be the difference that I wanted to see. I believed that it was my birthright. Unfortunately, my hopes and dreams of returning to academic medicine were shattered when I was informed that, due to affirmative action, my applications were not even considered. I was too white and too male. I had become a victim of reverse discrimination. I had no other option than to commit to a career in private practice. This meant that I would serve the approximately 16% of the population who could afford private medical insurance or medical schemes as they are called in South Africa. At one of the private hospitals that I worked at in the Pretoria area, I had my first exposure to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I was extremely skeptical. I have always been appalled by the woo-woo component of alternative medicine that ended up enchanting or conning patients while financially exploiting them at the same time. The hyperbaric unit at the Eugene Mary Hospital, run by Dr. Franz Cronier, only treated patients with internationally accepted indications based on evidence-based principles. My curiosity got the better of me, and before I knew it, I completed a course in hyperbaric medicine. The physics, mathematics, and biology of hyperbaric oxygen therapy were mind-blowing. I finally understood the concept of new vascularization. Within six months, I ended up taking over the hyperbaric unit. 
which meant that I was fully immersed. Was it possible that I was developing another passion? By the time I was able to get my bearings, I found myself actively involved in advanced wound care and actively involved in the Wound Healing Association of Southern Africa. I enrolled in the International Interdisciplinary Wound Care course in 2010, which opened another world to me and introduced me to many of the leaders in wound care. Because of my curiosity, hyperbaric oxygen therapy led to advanced wound care. I now practice as a vascular surgeon, hyperbaric physician and wound care specialist. Most of you have become interdisciplinary as well. In the process, we also understand the value of cooperation with other disciplines. But what about resource restricted environments? My situation could hardly be considered resource restricted. Steve Biko Academic Hospital is a government-run tertiary hospital with hyperbaric oxygen therapy facilities less than five kilometers away from my practice. Initially, we referred all of the patients who could not pay for our services to the Steve Biko Academic Hospital. There, they would have to wait for appointments and if and when their treatments were approved, would have to pay daily registration fees, which many patients could not afford. Some of these patients returned to me without receiving any treatment. It was obvious to me that we had to reinvent the system. The business model that we now apply has evolved over the past 14 years. We now try to accommodate all of the patients who are referred to us as long as they have one of the internationally accepted indications for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. These are considered our inclusion criteria. If a patient has a medical scheme, which is a form of medical insurance, usually paid in full by the patient, the medical scheme is approached to authorize and reimburse the treatment. About a third of the medical schemes in South Africa would approve the internationally accepted indications. The remaining two thirds of medical schemes consider hyperbaric oxygen therapy a fund exclusion. The patient will then be informed of the fund's decision. If the fund did not pay, the patient was, will be given the option of paying for the treatment at a significantly reduced rate. This amounts to approximately 60 US dollars. Most patients would be able to pay at least a part of their treatment. If the patient was not able to pay at all, the treatment would be given pro deo. The list of indications included on this slide are the internationally accepted indications also approved by the South African Underwater and Hyperbaric Medical Association. You'll notice the wound indications include enhancement of healing in selected problem wounds, necrotizing soft tissue infections, refractory osteomyelitis, delayed radiation injury, compromised skin grafts and flaps, and acute thermal burns. We projected that approximately 50% of patients would have full payment from their medical schemes, 25% of patients would pay themselves, and then 25% of treatments would be done at no cost to the patient. After applying this business model for approximately 14 years, the actual results were slightly different from what we initially expected. The medical schemes or medical funders covered the bill for approximately 54% of patients. 30% of patients paid for their own treatment at a significantly reduced rate. Only 16% of patients did not pay for their treatment at all. The majority of these patients were often critically ill inpatients in hospital. As far as the actual revenue is concerned, approximately 10% of the revenue gained from hyperbaric oxygen therapy is paid by patients whose medical schemes refuse to reimburse the treatment. Just shy of 90% of the total revenue was paid by, by the medical schemes. Although 16% of our patients who were treated did not pay at all, their response to treatment, the feedback that they gave their clinicians and families and their gratitude were priceless. In spite of the fact that this model that we have applied at our unit works for us, 
we are facing old and new challenges that will require us to change our approach. Some patients are just too proud to accept charity, but unable to pay the treatment themselves. A system by which the patient can pay the treatment over a period of time will require more administration, but is workable. Some patients accept the treatment at no cost, but end up not showing up at all and are sometimes quite rude towards personnel. They do not appreciate the gift. Due to the deteriorating economy in South Africa, few patients can afford medical schemes. Fewer medical schemes can afford expensive treatment modalities like hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So-called mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy applies pressures of 1.3 atmospheres absolute. Lay people, often completely unqualified, are applying therapy while misguiding patients that they can heal anything from acne through to the Zika virus. Unfortunately, COVID-19 had a very immediate and direct impact on our practice and we are still trying to recover, but grateful for the fact that we can continue. If I can be as bold as to suggest a few recommendations, I would suggest that we should always place the patient first. We should always stick to the internationally accepted indications for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and we should treat whoever needs hyperbaric oxygen therapy, especially in those patients who are deserving of the treatment based on the, the actual indication. It is useful to combine hyperbaric oxygen therapy with the rest of your clinical practice, whatever that may be. Always combine hyperbaric oxygen therapy with wound care. And remember to start small. Start slowly but surely and gradually push towards the future. Andrew Grove, founding member and past CEO of Intel, said that success breeds complacency. Complacency breeds failure. Only the paranoid survive. He was an advocate for setting up objectives and monitoring key results or outcomes. The paranoia to which Grove refers is one of refusing to let a company rest on its laurels, but rather to continuously test new products, techniques, sales channel and customers in order to be ready for the inevitable significant changes in the landscape of the business. Strategic inflection points, as he called them. We must set up our business models to be inclusive to reach as many people as possible. Profit margins mean nothing if a business has to close down. In a post-COVID era, only the paranoid will survive. Thank you for your attention.